session number 516, Reverend Timothy To Real One. Uh, Reverend Timothy, could you tell us uh, the situation in Singapore when the Japanese started to attack the country? I was awakened that early morning. Was it December 7th? About uh, 4 30. I was living in uh, Tiong Bahru at Singapore Road and uh, there was uh, an explosion and uh, when I went to the veranda I saw flaming onions pom 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 like that going above uh, the hill which was covered with a great it was a great yard then and uh, then I realized that the war had come and of course before that, we were all, as government servants, I was working in the Supreme Court as interpreter. We had to join what is known as the ARP, Air Raid uh, Precautions. We even had uh, gas masks that we had to wear to practice. But uh, at that point, I didn't do a thing, but just realized nervously that war had come. And then, of course, uh, when the situation got worse, though Sir Shenton Thomas was boasting on the radio that uh, the Japanese will be thrown into the sea as sure as the sun will rise tomorrow. I still remember him saying that. Uh, I was working also for Radio Malaya and uh, Mr. Dobby. D-O-B-B-Y, who was lecturer of uh, geography in the Raffles College. Though I was working as a Supreme Court interpreter three nights a week, I would go to the radio monitoring section, which was housed in uh, the present Cathay building on an upper floor. Uh, I would go there to monitor the broadcast of the Japanese especially in Mandarin, Hokkien and Cantonese and to write a report what they are saying that the government might uh, have a feedback of what is going on. So that was my job. Then um, as the situation got worse, uh, we retreated to Tuapayo. My uncle had a little estate in Ahut Road. And there we built our arid shelters, we stayed. And when the Japanese were in full blast in the attack, shells uh, fell thick and fast in our compound. And uh, one family of my uncle's friends got hit, though they were dug inside, um, into the slope of the hill. I still remember my father rendering first aid because he was a doctor. Animals, cows, straight into our, into our estate. Everything was in turmoil. But then we were spared going to the concentration because living inside, nobody said anything, nobody came there, not even a Japanese soldier at kid. So we were living in a ignorant bliss. Finally, when we came out, I was returning to my home in Singapore Road, Tiong Bahru. We realized that um, all the crossroads were stationed with Japanese troops. And of course, we were very frightened. Everyone passing by must go and bow to the sentry before he can make a move. So, after I got back to Singapore Road, number 21A, I joined my friend downstairs, who was working at the naval base. Hearing that all government servants must report back for duty. 
we went to the present city council. We call it the municipal building. And then we fill in forms. And uh, before long, we went each one to our respective offices. And uh, the chief clerk, of course, was a liaison officer between the Japanese and the local uh, staff of clerks and so forth. And so we were taken back. We had a salary cut of 20%. I was drawing 110 before the fall of Singapore, so I remember I got 86 of banana notes. Well, I served in the Supreme Court building, but soon a new department came into the building, namely the uh, research department under uh, Lieutenant Mukai. He was a sort of a professor or lecturer in economics from Japan, but of course they all came dressed in their military uniform, carrying their swords, appeared very dignified and um, maybe quite fearful when you look at their sword. So while I reported to work with the court, there was nothing by way of a court work because there was no there, there was no no trial. So few legal there were for a while simply there were no cases because we were under the military. So I was um, alone to the research department to do clerical work, copying Japanese. Lieutenant Mukai would uh, research into all the regions around Singapore, Sumatra, and um, all this whole, whole region in Japanese. Then I'll copy them neatly on uh, stencil. And then this recycle style. And then the staple in the booklets and distribute it to the Japanese officers that they may know what is going on in this region. So for quite some months, I was uh, working in the research department as a copist. But we went to Japanese school very zealously. I know as young people, you did not want to waste your time and we felt that whatever learning we could procure, Japanese or any language, and even then to get along in a Japanese world without in Japanese, you will be stuck. So, being in the linguistic line, we caught on Japanese very quickly. And before long, uh, the courts, when they functioned, I was um, installed as one of the official interpreters in Japanese. And then, uh, 19, early 1943, now that the courts was were functioning and uh, well before I come to this I'll say that um, there were queues of these uh, prisoners were brought to the Attorney General's office which was housed in the Supreme Court and they all had their hands you know bound uh, behind their back and uh, these were all brought in to, for questioning and but usually a few questions were put to them the Attorney General just Read over the notes, and I still remember one of them was Sir Han Ho Lim. Sir Lim Han Ho, well, he was well known before the war, knighted by the British. I did not know him, I knew his name, and I, I saw him there, and he was uh, indicted for, I think, having a radio set. Many of these who were sent to the High Court practically had no lawyers to defend them, and most of the charges are explained to them and they pleaded guilty and if guilty they say case, 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 death sentence. So many of these were sentenced to death for being anti-Japanese or being involved in some sort of a clandestine you know, uh, work. And then the early part of 1943 they had a uh, 
scheme to train local officers in what is known as the Judicial Officers Training Institute. And uh, there were the Japanese judges, very fine people, and they are, you know, they are learned men of, of law, uh, quite gentle, they are not rough and tough. But then they got hold of all the legal officers or lawyers on the scene to teach us. Among them was um, L.C. Go. Uh, he was a magistrate of the courts. Uh, Mr. Braga, who was a famous criminal lawyer, Mr. K. I. Tan, a civil lawyer, Tan Tun Lip, who was a registrar of the Supreme Court, or deputy registrar of the Supreme Court. And, uh, oh, several others, plus the Japanese Oh yeah, Mr. S, who was another deputy registrar of the Supreme Court. All these became our teachers, plus one course in Japanese law. All the law was studied in English. There was no change of law at all to our street settlements code. One course in Japanese law we studied was very interesting. That. Uh, the respect is non-compoundable. We must uh, punish with the imprisonment. In Japanese law, theft by a servant is compoundable. That's the oriental system. We had to study Japanese as well. So one Mr. Uh, one Japanese teacher was assigned to us, and the most interesting thing was he was trying to indoctrinate us that the Japanese are uh, divine people ascend, uh, descended from Amaterasu o Mikami-sama, that is the sun goddess. And that uh, her great-grandson, Jimu Tenno, came down from heaven. And he taught us um, as if he was preaching the gospel. He, he taught us really with a, with a sincerity that, he, that uh, this was the truth, of which of course, we received with uh, many grains of salt uh, within us. So that was an interesting period. And then by, um, oh yeah, it is uh, not 1943, it's 1944, I'm sorry. 1944, we had uh, two terms of six months, six months. By 1945, uh, by June, we had completed our course. It's an intensive one-year course of two, two semesters of six months each, with one little break of a, a week or so, very intensive. So when we graduated, there were 12 of us. And of those who graduated of this class, after the war, I think at least uh, half of them made good as uh, lawyers. They went to England for further training. One was Mr. Sarwan Singh Gill, who was High Court Judge in Ipoh, but now he's retired. One was Mr. Lao Seng Boon. He became a lawyer, but uh, now he's uh, already left the scene. One was Syed Osman from Jawbaru. I think he joined the legal service of uh, the federal government. Another one was Abbas, a Malay, small Malay boy. How he became, I don't know. But uh, there were two or three Indians. One was Lim Kian Chai. He was involved in politics from Penang. And one was I. <laughs> but after the war, uh, God called me from my Earthly ambition. If I had, in fact, I was booked on the cargo boat, the Argus, for 90 pounds. I resigned from the Supreme Court after the war with all the best of testimonials from all my teachers, plus a very good testimonial from the president of the military court. We are under the military administration still. 
I had a good recommendation by the director of, in, of uh, education. All these were British officers. And I got admitted to London University and Middle Temple. And if I had sail, one that was going to sail with me was Said, what was uh, Esa Almona. He was involved in politics too, Esa Almona. But I didn't go because uh, God turned my steps from legal studies to theology because um, of the death of my mother and little baby daughter within five weeks of each other. And um, that deeply solemnized my viewpoint of life. So I went to China instead, to Nanking to study 1946. I went. I resigned from the Supreme Court. They were very sad. They wanted me to go back. But I had already resigned to go to London. But now that uh, these two deaths occurred, I didn't go to London, I went to China. Then from there, I went to America for theological studies until I graduated in 1950. Then I came back here. I've been pastor of this church from 1950 to now. And I founded the Far Eastern Bible College in 1962. Going back to the time of the British surrender, yeah. you mentioned that you did not see a single Japanese soldier at all until you came out yeah, came from Baru. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when did you come out? I still remember the Chinese New Year, you know, and um, I believe it was uh, just one day or two after the disbanding those concentration camps and all that, I came out. So I, we, we, we stayed in a few days, a few days. We did not move, actually. We knew that it's surrender already. We, all the Japanese planes were Navy O and the Army planes were zooming in triumph, no? zooming all over Singapore like bees. No? We knew that the war was over. No? Um, that was when you were still at Ahut Road. You Ahut saw Road. all these planes. Yeah, yeah, all the planes. And we were amazed when they came to town, we saw little um, midget tanks, very small tanks. It's really a, really a sight. Little midget tank, tanks. In when you came out to the town, did you encounter any um, troubles with the Japanese along the way? Fortunately, no. <laughs> Somehow we got back home and then uh, we were safe at home and then we heard our friend downstairs say, Hey, you have got to go and sign up, let's go tomorrow. It's, they are announcing that all must go and and report back. Then we went. Do you remember who did you report to on the next day? We all went back to the, we call it the municipality building, you know this, municipal, uh, municipality building. And uh, then we saw a chief clerk. And then we went to the, uh, we all had to gather at the meeting even. And then we had to bow to the Japanese flag. The Japanese officer was giving a long lecture of all the civil servants who were gathered back. That's one thing I remember. Uh, that was the first day that you reported back? Yeah, yeah. That's right. After we reported back, we were herded to, a, to the big hall of the city council. As you enter you know, the steps, there's a hall there, and then down there they lectured us. Do you remember who gave the lecture? Oh, no. We were quite frightened then. <laughs> um, when you went back to the Supreme Court, were there any changes in terms of the whole structure or organisation of the judicial system or the courts? Only the Attorney General's office got incorporated in one of the rooms of the Supreme Court. Usually the Attorney General's office is outside of the court building. I think it's in the old government building. But they concentrated together, the court and the Attorney General's office. Any changes in terms of the uh, organization? No, the, the, the court was very well uh, preserved. No, no invention of anything. Uh, did the Japanese take over the... I mean, were there... Uh, who were in charge of the whole... of the courts? Well, we have the... Chief Judge. 
judges. Attorney General. And uh, our old chip club had to serve them. So everything goes through the chip club. They, they use the old offices as usual. But the judges were all Japanese? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All are Japanese. No. Yeah, even K.N. Byrne lectured to us. <laughs> that is interesting. Byrne was out there. Byrne was a magistrate before. What happened to the those judges who were there pre-war? Those were taken into custody. Either if they couldn't run away, they must be in Changi. But all the, uh, there was no more those uh, British judges left. I think they all ran away. So the Japanese only retained those local people as magistrates and other... Ah, uh, these who are the locals are drawn back to, to teach us. No pure-blooded Englishmen. They would be under constitution. But the rest are Singaporean. Whether it be Braga or Bern, they are Eurasians. Um, did the military impose or um, make any changes to the civilian courts? Did the Japanese military? No, they kept to the law, kept to the Singapore law throughout. It's very difficult to change a law, you know. A law is there, then you've got to observe it. So basically the um, law is still British? Same, same, British law. They didn't change it. What about the implementations of these lo um, laws? The way that the Japanese carry out their cases? The lawyers were out of job. <laughs> I don't see that they had any chance to uh, earn a living under the Japanese. Because uh, as far as the High Court was concerned, there were so few cases. And if they came, most of it, mostly they got a death sentence. According to them, it's a pretty bad case. You know? Uh, you know, underground activity, all that. Did you notice any uh, differences in the way that the Japanese perhaps conduct a case. For instance, you mentioned that most of the cases were given a death sentence. Uh, was it usual or unusual? They had a Japanese prosecutor and I don't remember having seen any lawyer representing these poor fellows. You know. They just charged in court and they got to defend themselves. And we interpreters have to make it known to them what they were charged for. Um, so it was very different from... There were, there were some lawyers in court, but then uh, many of them couldn't afford. You know, they were just... Some of them are Malaysians or Malayans. They have no contact, they are arrested. Then they are brought there and just get stuck there. Very poor, miserable creatures. So it was different from the pre-war British court because that... Oh, yeah, that yeah, 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 but that, uh, that, that is surely different. And also, there were no jurors. Then we also had uh, five of the heads. They were cut off and they were set up at uh, various vantage points you know, of the city to scare the people. Uh, these are the bad, bad heads, so they had five heads displayed. Could you tell us some of the perhaps the similarities or the differences in the courts under the Japanese and under, compared with the British times in terms of perhaps uh, work procedures, decision making? There wasn't that British tradition at all. No. And the courts were rather silent places like churches on a weekday. <laughs> Very few people would never be... I'm referring only to the Supreme Court where I was. The district courts and the lower courts, magistrates courts, I cannot say very much because I didn't go and, and visit them. I was always occupied. You know, partly, most... Uh, half of the time in the research department, copying, copying in Japanese. So only cases of uh, bigger proportions were heard in the Supreme Court? The daily affairs, I think, they are run in the magistrate courts. But these who go there are very serious cases, mostly political, I think. Yeah. Uh, did anyone escape without a death sentence passed on them? 
I remember most of them got <laughs> death sentences. Yeah, there were some who were let off or given a lighter sentence, but mostly got death sentences. From your recollections, who were these people mainly who were prosecuted in the court? They were underground activities, uh, a communist, you know, all concerned the maintenance of uh, the peace of the land. They were seditious, of a seditious nature. such as uh, owning a radio set. So all these were considered illegal in the Japanese eyes? Oh, yeah, yeah, you cannot. When we came in, it was announced, uh, you know, uh, that all radio sets should be surrendered and just put by the five-foot way. So I surrendered my radio set, put it by the five-foot way, and uh, then the government people came in the lorry, they collected all of them. How did these um, Japanese judges treat the workers, the employees? Oh, they were quite, uh, I should say, friendly, but rather non-committal. They beyond that, they were getting their salary, and uh, sometimes they would uh, talk with us um, on uh, just like uh, good weather and such things. They wouldn't go deeply, you know, into, into more uh, private matters. So, they might ask you your family, you know, your wife, your children, uh, but beyond that, there was not the rapport. Some, of course, are very, very gentle looking, you know, they, after all, they are scholars. Uh, not one of them uh, was a military man? These are all civilian officers in military uniform because they are the administrators of the land, legal officers. Clerks, or they bring their clerks too and so on. Could you remember what kind of uniform they were wearing? Yeah, khaki uniform with a you know, soft cap, that knife, that sword that they carry. Everyone the same. With their boots and leggings. And when they walk, they just... Uh, Drag their feet, no? Croc, 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 <laughs> like ducks. <laughs> Any difference in their uniform compared with the military personnel? No, they're the same military uniform, exactly the same. It was at when you went back to Supreme Court that you took up the Japanese language lessons? I took up uh, Japanese lessons by way of uh, interest. Being an interpreter I was very interested in languages. Mm -hmm. So when the British were still here, I was learning Japanese under a colleague. He's a Japanese interpreter, Kir Kiryu. So both uh, Mr. Lao Sing Boon and myself, we were language enthusiasts. So um, we learned uh, Japanese under Kiryu. And uh, we had bought a very good grammar called Bakari's 60 lessons in Japanese. Bakari was an Italian author, very famous. So both Sengbun and myself, we learned Japanese under Kiryu in those days, just because we feel that uh, it's good to learn a, a new language being interpreters. So at the time when you went back to Supreme Court under the Japanese, you already knew the language? No, <laughs> it's hard to, to learn the language. In a, in a matter of months, we had, we had just about, uh, I don't think more than three or four months of Japanese that we started when the war came. And uh, maybe we had a sort of a head start over the others, but we had to go to Japanese school at Oxley Rice. It was called the Hongganji. Hongganji was a temple, one of the mentions there was taken over by the Japanese and uh, there was one Japanese priest who taught 